7 minutes and 24 seconds. That's how long it took this gunman, Devin Kelly, to kill 26 people while they worshipped at First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs. The thing is, before Devin Kelly walked into this church, he handcuffed his wife to the bed and told his kids he'd see them soon. But before I get into today's story, I am your host, Mama Margo, former active duty military attorney turned mom, turned podcaster, and now you can say turned YouTuber. If you are interested in all things newsworthy and true crime, you've come to the right place. Storytelling is what I do, and I try to do so in an informative manner while also remaining respectful to all those involved. I will be uploading two videos a month, so if anything that I just said piques your interest, be sure to subscribe and be sure to turn on all notifications so you never miss an upload. And before I get to today's story, major trigger warnings here. If you're new here, me too, because this is a new channel. But listen, this channel is not intended for children. And for this case, I have some major trigger warnings. This case involves mass murder, the murder of children and elderly people. It also involves domestic violence, violence against children, and animal cruelty. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Before Devin Kelly walked into that tiny little church in Sutherland Springs, he had a history, and it wasn't a good one. Devin Kelly was born on February 12, 1991 in San Marcos, Texas, to his mother Rebecca and his father Michael Kelly. Devin was a homeschool kid, at least until he got to high school. But once he got to high school, he was kind of creepy and not just, you know, kind of awkward teenager type. He was creepy in that he would grope and try and touch his female classmates and they did not approve of that. While at New Brothels High School, Devin was suspended at least six times for various offenses, including the possession and use of drugs, the use of profane language, and insubordination. After he was arrested for possessing marijuana while he was in high school, he got six months probation and he was ordered to complete 60 hours of community service. Anyway, let's fast forward. He eventually graduates from high school and six months later, on January 5th, 2010, he joined joined the United States Air Force. But his Air Force career didn't go so well because as soon as he started, he flunked out of intelligence school. And then the Air Force sent him to become a traffic management apprentice. It's while Devin is at his training in Fort Lee, Virginia, where he begins to date a woman he knew from back home. She was a single mom by the name of Tessa. She had a young son who I will call Jack, not his real name, but he was just an infant at the time. Well, Tessa and Devin get married in April of 2011. And by that summer, Tessa, Devin, and baby Jack are on their way to PCS to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. But almost as soon as they arrive in New Mexico, baby Jack becomes increasingly ill. Jack was hospitalized for vomiting, diarrhea, and seizures. And after spending three days in the hospital, he is sent home. But almost as soon as he was sent home, he was back in the ER. But this time, the doctor noticed clear signs of bruising, which seemed to indicate some sort of abuse. The baby was examined and he had a broken clavicle and blood on the brain. The baby was immediately taken into state custody. Tessa did not quite understand why anyone would think that she abused her child. She hadn't. But it wouldn't take long for her to realize that it was her husband, Devin Kelly. In fact, he had laid hands on her before they were even married. And he continued to do so after the marriage began. So it's June of 2011 and baby Jack is in the hospital. By the end of that month, Devin strangled his wife and threw her against the wall. Tessa confided in a friend who then reported it to Devin's leadership. However, as often happens in domestic violence cases, when investigators spoke to Tessa, she refused to make a statement. During this time frame, Devin was also voluntarily seeking mental health treatment. He was treating ADHD, generalized anxiety disorder, depression, and the list goes on. He was also on various medications. Anyway, at this point, there's nothing stopping Devin Kelly from purchasing a firearm. And on February 12th, 2012, he heads over to the base exchange and he purchases a 38 Special Revolver. Within days of this gun purchase, Tessa decides to actually report Devin. And when she does, she unleashes everything. She says that he has strangled her, he's hit her, he's pushed her, he's kicked her, he's even pulled her hair and dragged her across the room. And then she reports that in January of 2012, while she 
was on vacation with her husband, a family friend reported to her that he had attempted to sexually assault her. Tessa confronts Devin and he's like, yeah, I did do it. And if you ever tell anyone, I will kill you. When Devin was brought in for questioning about this allegation, I don't know whether he speaks or not because I couldn't find that anywhere. However, he is told to turn in his weapon to his first sergeant and he obeys. After this, Devin checks himself into an inpatient mental health facility. It's called the Peak Behavioral Health Services in Santa Teresa, New Mexico. Devin stays there for two weeks, and while he's there, he's diagnosed with adjustment disorder with depressed mood and ADHD. During the next several months after he's out of the facility, he ends up going back to the base exchange and he purchases a nine millimeter gun. And then within days of him making this purchase, he receives a letter of reprimand from his unit. Mind you, all of this is going on and Tessa still does not have custody of her son, Jack. In response to the letter of reprimand that he received from his boss, a letter of reprimand in essence is a letter where the command is saying you did something bad. In this case, it was that he physically abused his wife. Well, in his response to this letter, he basically gives a mia culpa, that he's so sorry that his two weeks in inpatient treatment have made him a new man. But turns out he wasn't a changed man because two weeks after this, while he's in the car with Tessa, he takes his gun out, he points it at her and says, do you want to die? Then he proceeds to place it in his mouth and threaten to take himself out. However, he doesn't. He puts it away and then he threatens Tessa that if she ever tells anyone about this incident, incident, he will take her out. And then Devin makes an admission. He admits to her that he did beat baby Jack and he says it all started while they were just dating. Days later, Devin records himself during a 20 minute confession where he admits to shaking the baby, slapping the baby, and that's just to name a few things. In the letter, Devin admits that Tessa had nothing to do with the injuries to her child. So let me tell you, portions of this video confession were released by KPRC to Houston and you can see Devin say, quote, this is not the first mistake and this is not the last mistake. There's probably plenty to come, unfortunately, end quote. This time, due to his homicidal and self-harm ideations, he is placed in the high-risk category. While Devin is an inpatient, Tessa takes this opportunity to go back to the military investigators and basically continue to participate in their investigation. Meanwhile, this is happening and Devin is in the mental health facility and he's using their computers to Google gun purchases, body armor, things that I didn't think you'd be able to do, especially if you're high risk. But wait, on June 6th, while he's still at inpatient treatment, Homeboy calls the base exchange and is like, yeah, I'm gonna need you to hold that nine millimeter for me. But the base exchange knows better and instead they contact the Office of Special Investigations. That, however, does not stop Devin because he sneaks out of the mental health facility, he hops a fence and he makes his way over to the Greyhound station. When the facility reports him missing, they're like, this dude is very dangerous. And just so you know, he might be attempting to carry out some death threats against his military superiors. Before things can get too out of hand, Devin is apprehended and returned. However, the very next day, he checks himself out out of the mental health facility. While this is all going on, the Air Force is trying to get charges spun up to charge this guy with abusing his wife and his stepchild. And eventually they do place him in pretrial confinement pending those charges. In November of 2012, Devin goes on to plead guilty to the charges involving his wife and his stepson. He is subsequently sentenced to one year in confinement, a bad conduct discharge, and reduction to the rank of E1. Now break break, it should be noted that at this point, point when he has a conviction for domestic violence, his conviction is reportable, but due to an oversight, Devin's conviction was not reported. On March 31st, 2013, Devin was released from military confinement and within the year, his affiliation to the military was severed. In addition to this conviction and to being kicked out of the military, the military had a barment order put into place, whereas Devin could not return onto any military installation. Now, let me rewind just a little bit. While Devin was in jail, Tessa was able to safely get a divorce from him. 
When Devin got out of jail, he went to live with his parents at a property that they owned in New Braunfels, Texas. And listen, as soon as this guy got out of jail, he continued to commit crimes. Almost as soon as Devin Kelly was released, he allegedly sexually assaulted a woman at his parents' house. This incident was reported to authorities. However, when they came to interview the alleged victim, she did not want to participate or be interviewed. And the case is closed. So let's fast forward a year. So it's 2014, Devin Kelly somehow manages to start dating another woman. Her name is Danielle. And even though there appears to be some domestic violence issues, in April of 2014, they get married. They eventually go on to have two children later. After they get married, Devin and his 19 year old wife move to Colorado Springs. And almost as soon as he gets there, he gets in trouble with the law. This time for animal cruelty issues with something related to his own own dog. For this incident in the summer of 2014, he is sentenced to 18 months of probation. He has to take an animal cruelty class. He has to pay for the shelter fees for his dog. And he also has to pay like a $168 fine. Well, on December 22nd, 2014, as a Christmas gift to himself, Devin Kelly goes to a store and purchases himself a nine millimeter handgun. When he filled out the paperwork to purchase this gun, he answered no when asked if he had been convicted of a felony or any other crimes for which the judge could have imprisoned him for more than one year. Sadly, Devin should not have been allowed to purchase this gun due to his prior conviction. However, due to an oversight in the military, that paperwork, that court martial paperwork and that post-trial paperwork had not been filed appropriately. And so there was no way for the database to know about the conviction. So at this time, December of 2014, Danielle, Devin's wife, she notices that he becomes obsessed with guns, excessively cleaning them, taking them out to play, and taking them out to shoot. Six months after his nine millimeter purchase, he purchases a 357 Magnum revolver. In 2015, Devin and his wife move back to Texas, and it's here where Devin tries to get a license to carry a gun. However, due to his animal cruelty conviction from Colorado, he is not a allowed to get that license. Well, that doesn't stop Devin. And then in August of 2015, Devin hadn't even been in Texas that long. He drives his little happy self to San Antonio, the base there, Joint Base San Antonio Lackland, and he tries to get access onto the installation. However, due to the barman order that was put into place when he was kicked out of the military, he's not allowed onto the base. Which begs the question, why was he trying to get on base anyway? What business did he have there? But wait, he tries again. This time it's February of 2016 and Devin drives to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico and tries to get access to that base. Now you might recall at the beginning of the story where I said Holloman Air Force Base is where he was stationed when he was court-martialed. But again, thank goodness, Devin is not allowed onto the installation. So let's fast forward a few months. It's April 7th, 2016, and Devin walks into an Academy Sports store and he purchases an AR-556. And unbeknownst to everyone else, Devin continues to spiral into a deep, deep hole. And this next part is very chilling because months, years after he had been out of the military, he goes on to send his supervisor, his old supervisor at Holloman Air Force Base, a chilling Facebook message. The first message was in September and it read, hey, you stupid you should have been put in the ground a long time ago. Better hope I don't ever see you. You can't face facts, you fat piece of shit. Months later, he sent her another message where he basically said that his only regret is not putting her in the dirt when he had the chance. On October 18th, 2017, just weeks before the massacre, Devin goes back to Academy Sports and he purchases another gun. This time, it's a 22 caliber handgun. During the months leading up to the massacre, Devin became more and more controlling with his wife. Daniel told investigators that he didn't let her out of his sight. He even took her to and from work. During the birth of their children, Devin sent Daniel's family threatening messages. And one time he even pushed her grandmother. And this next thing is so evil. Devin once wrote on Facebook, my wife was the right person to marry, but the rest of them could get shot in the face and I'd laugh. What in the world is wrong with people? Did someone report that to Facebook? And the thing about this whole case is that the location where the massacre occurred, First Baptist Church, well, that used to be Danielle's 
church. I mean, she was an avid church member there. And that was all before she met Devin. Because after she got together with him, Devin didn't like her going. And so she stopped going to that church. Apparently, Devin was some sort of atheist and he belonged to a whole bunch of atheist Facebook groups. But anyway, the week before the massacre, First Baptist Church at Sutherland Springs hosted a fall festival. And guess who attended? Devin Kelly himself. But once he was there, everybody got really weird vibes from him. Not only was he wearing all black, which come on, that's not illegal. However, it was just the way that he was acting and they actually patted him down for weapons. So Danielle goes on to tell authorities that she had continuously asked Devin for a divorce. However, every time she asked him for a divorce, it just led to being assaulted, like more domestic violence. And it turns out that the week leading up to the massacre, she had asked him for a divorce. And Devin allegedly was like, all right, cool. I'll give you a divorce. So let's talk about the massacre. Investigators believe that Devin had been planning this massacre since the summer of 2017, July to be specific, because that's when he ramped up his purchases, including purchasing body armor, 100 round drum magazines, and he even made to-do lists on his iPhone notes. One note read, I am the angel of death. No one can stop me. His tasks included delete social media accounts, destroy phones, clear YouTube account, and his browser history. And he also said, leave dog tags for son. On November 5th, 2017, unbeknownst to his wife, Devin would not be returning home that night. That morning, Devin asked Danielle to make him a light breakfast, which he promptly ate, but then threw up. Then he told his wife it was almost time. Danielle was like, almost time for what? She thought he was talking about work. Then they sat on the couch when all of a sudden Devin jumped up, he grabbed his son and put him in the room with the baby. Then he ordered or forced his wife into the bedroom where he proceeded to tie her to the bed using handcuffs, rope, and duct tape. He then armed himself with an AR-556, ammo, magazines, a bulletproof vest, more tactics, tactical gear, and then he left. At some point in the chaos that Devin Kelly had created himself, he contacted his parents via a text message and said, go to my house and help my wife. She needs you. So Devin's parents, they rush over to Devin's house that he shares with Danielle. Remember, they live on the same property and they find Danielle like strapped to the bed and they're trying to get her off, but she has these handcuffs and they can't find the handcuff key and it is just pure chaos. In the chaos, they contact Devin and they're like, where is the handcuff key? And this happens after after the shooting and Devin Kelly is like talking crazy. He's like, I shot up all these people in Sutherland Springs. And they're like, what are you talking about? And eventually they get the wife off of the bed and Devin basically tells her, this is all your fault. And then he pulls the trigger, taking his own life. But the thing is, minutes before he took his own life, he had stole the lives of 26 people. Sutherland Springs is a teeny tiny town right outside of San Antonio. It boasts 600 residents, a church at the center, and two gas stations. Sunday service at First Baptist Church begins promptly at 9.15 with breakfast. At about 10.45, there's the church meet and greet, and then at 11 a.m., church service begins, usually with announcements. On November 5th, 2017, the church pastor, Frank Pomeroy, was out of town. So in his place was associate pastor, Brian Holcomb he was set to give the sermon that morning. At about 11.15 in the morning, Pastor Brian's wife, Carla, was up at the front giving morning announcements when all of a sudden they heard gunfire. People turned to look where it was coming from, but it was coming from outside the church and some people thought it was just fireworks. But soon everyone realized it wasn't fireworks when holes started popping through the back of the church. In walked a man wearing a mask. He was all domed with tactical gear, a bulletproof vest, carrying a large gun with tons of ammo. And as this man walked in, he yelled, everybody die. And then he continued opening fire inside the church. As the man continued to shoot, the small church filled with smoke. At one point, the gunman left the church. He went outside. It appeared that he was doing that to reload. 
road. And then he re-entered the church and continued the massacre. And then by 11.23 a.m., he left the church for the last time. Outside the church, a nearby resident by the name of Stephen Williford heard the gunfire, probably heard the screams. He grabbed his AR-15 and ran outside barefoot. When he got outside, he saw Devin Kelly carrying his AR-556 and he shot at him. And Stephen Williford hit Devin twice, once in the back and once in the left thigh. Devin immediately dropped his weapon, jumped into his SUV and took off. At the same time that this is happening, Johnny Langendorf is driving by when all of a sudden Stephen Williford waves him down, stops him, tells him what's happening, jumps in the car and then says, go after him. At which point they take off going at speeds up to 95 miles per hour. All the while this madness is going on, Johnny is on the phone with 911 while he's driving 95 miles per hour. He's telling them the location of the gunman when all of a sudden about 11 miles north of Sutherland Springs, Devin Kelly crashes his car into some sort of ditch. And right there in that ditch is where Devin Kelly takes his own life. After the tragedy at Sutherland Springs, nearly 80 victims and surviving family members of victims sue the federal government, claiming that due to the Air Force's failure to report Devin Kelly's criminal history, their family members were no longer here. At the bench trial, which took place in April of 2021, the judge tended to agree with the family members. He concluded that the Air Force or the federal government was 60% responsible for what Devin Kelly did on November 5th, 2017. In February of 2022, after taking three months to deliberate about the damages, about the number, how much damages the families were going to get, Judge Rodriguez ordered the Air Force to pay more than $230 million to survivors and families of the victims of the Sutherland Springs shooting. The Department of Justice has appealed the judge's ruling, and it's possible that there may be a settlement in the future. Before I end, these are the beautiful souls who lost their lives on that frightful Sunday morning. In grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now am found was blind If you got something out of today's video and you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button and turn on all your notifications so you don't miss my next video. And P.S. If you like the way that I tell stories, be sure to check out my true crime podcast called Military Murder, where I focus on only true crime that happens against or by military members. Now listen, I drop two episodes in my podcast feed every single month, but wait, there are over 120 full episodes waiting for you to binge. So go ahead, subscribe to my podcast as well.